Well, welcome. And thank you for joining us for this launch, the next phase of the Government to University Initiative, which is a signature initiative of the Volcker Alliance. Uh, my name is Tom Ross, and I'm the president of, Volker, of the Volcker Alliance. And for those of you who have not encountered uh, our organization before, and this may be your first time hearing about us, Paul Volcker launched the Volcker Alliance in 2013. And he did so because he was motivated by the vision of a public sector workforce with experience, preparation, and commitment to ensure that government at all levels delivers with excellence. The mission of the Alliance is to advance the effective management of government to achieve results that matter to citizens. The Volcker Alliance has pursued this mission by catalyzing action to promote transparency in government finance, modernize the civil service system, advance prudential regulatory structures, and to implement strategies that will inspire and prepare the next generation of public servants. We are thrilled to have this fantastic blend of public servants, academic, lever, academic leaders, and believers uh, in effective government assembled here today and on our live stream. And we're deeply grateful for all of you joining us. I'm particularly pleased uh, that the directors of the FEBs who are meeting today in Chicago are tuning in on live stream for this event. They were, several of their members were a big help to us uh, in the, the pilot stage, exploratory stage of this endeavor. And I appreciate very much their help and they'll be key partners as we move forward. By the end of our time together this morning, I hope we will have accomplished three things. First, to share what G2U is all about, why it matters, and the potential it has to drive needed change. Second, to introduce you to some of our early partners in this endeavor, to spotlight a few of the promising ideas and strategies that they are championing. And third, and perhaps most importantly, I hope that we will have inspired you to join us in this movement to strengthen partnerships between government and universities regionally and nationwide. I think it's important that we reflect for a moment on how we got to where we are today. Last fall, we were fortunate to have Dustin Brown, the Deputy Assistant Director for Management at the Office of Management and Budget, join our team at the Alliance as part of his sabbatical. Dustin's here today. Together, we had a hunch, actually it was his hunch, I just claim credit, that structured partnerships between government at all levels in a region and universities who are located close by could provide a catalytic response to high need areas for government. Particularly, we surmised that strong government university relationships could improve government's access to top talent, ensure that the current and future workforce is properly skilled and as relevant reskilled, and grease the wheels for desperately needed applied research, analytics, and program evaluation around government activities. To test this hypothesis, our team hit the road. We convened roundtables in four cities, Pittsburgh, Chapel Hill, Kansas City, and Austin, and brought together over 200 people, university professors, career service leaders, deans, and students from various schools in each region, alongside of government officials from federal agencies, state, counties, cities, and towns located nearby. We learned a great deal during this process. Personally, even though I've been at this for a long time, both on the G side and the U side of the equation. I was amazed uh, at the extent to which the participants appreciated the power of bringing government and university practitioners together at the same time in the same room. And I was also surprised at how infrequently this happens. We learned that there is an urgency around the need to test new strategies for recruiting top talent into the public workforce. There's a palpable energy surrounding the imperative of better connecting government's most pressing research needs 
with student and faculty research capacity at universities. And there's a shared belief that there is a special opportunity to organize these efforts regionally to drive change. You'll hear much more uh, about what we learned and what we heard during these sessions during our substantive program, which is, in my humble opinion, a good one. But before the program begins, um, as you know, this is a launch event. So you might be asking yourself, what exactly is going to be launched? Uh, and I don't want to keep you in suspense. So we believe regional networks of governments and universities can make, a, can make meaningful progress on growing the pipeline of talented people into government, developing the right workforce for now and the future, and promoting productive research exchanges to make progress on government's stickiest challenges. Because of our deep belief in the regional approach and the value of sustainable networks, those two underpinnings, I'm excited to announce that this spring we will be launching two G2U regional councils, one in Kansas City and one in Austin, Texas. These G2U councils will serve as a regional marketplace, an exchange to match government research, workforce development, and hiring needs, the demand side, with local university capacity, the supply side. This is not a one-way street, however. We are confident that both the G and the U will benefit from this new marketplace. The Alliance will be providing technical assistance and support at these pilot sites as they launch. We will partner with stakeholders on the ground to put in place a governance structure for the G2U councils, identify impactful priorities, and enlist support of local leaders and practitioners from all sectors that will be required if we are to succeed. Furthermore, we will continue to aggressively expand this network nationally. We aim to launch additional sites as soon as this fall as interest demands and resources allow. I am truly excited about the promise of this initiative. I hope that by the end of today's program, you will leave with strong understanding of the G2U approach and its potential so that we can speak together further about how we might collaborate to scale this effort and make the needed change we all know is there. So enough from me. Let's start our formal program. And to begin, I would like to introduce and welcome Margaret Weikert to help provide some direction setting remarks. Margaret is the Deputy Director for Management at the Office of Management and Budget and the Acting Director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. Before joining government, she was a principal at Ernst & Young and has held executive positions at Market Platform Dynamics, First Data, Bank of America, and Anderson Consulting, all focused on strategy, innovation, and business process improvement in banking and in payment technology. And to top it all off, she holds 14 patents. She is an inspiring leader, and she is working hard every day for a government that prioritizes its talent management and leverages the best knowledge from other sectors to serve its citizens. So please join me in welcoming Margaret Weikert. My pleasure. The water is fresh. Thank you. OK. Um, so I'm going to do the thing that my team hates the most, which is not use all of my notes. I'm, I'm, I have my notes, so I'm going to hit some of the points. Um, but I'm here today in Washington, D.C., and a year ago, I was in Kansas City because we launched the President's Management Agenda, the, the agenda, the forward-looking, multi-year journey roadmap for transformation in government management in the heart of our country. So we went to Kansas City, and that was apparently kind of a surprising decision. Um, didn't seem surprising to me because you want to go to the heart if you're going to tell a story about something that needs to connect across our country. And so we went to uh, Kansas City to kick off a recommitment 
to something that this community knows full well is important and ongoing. So we focus the efforts of our government activity around the management agenda to ensure that we stayed connected to the missions that we have in government, the why, the purpose of why we're here. We wanted to recommit ourselves to service that is worthy of the American people, service quality that feels modern and appropriate in the 21st century. And then to reinforce the notion of stewardship in a world of scarce resources, stewarding taxpayer resources in a world of competing priorities. And we really looked at what were the barriers to achievement on that front. And I, I talked about when I was in Kansas City, the notion that most of the ideas about good government aren't new. The modalities of how we work towards them may change from time to time, but the, the real underpinning barriers to change also weren't new, and they were highly interconnected. So IT modernization, everyone knew, was a priority. And we've thrown literally billions of dollars at this problem, and yet we still are dealing with legacy IT environments that prevent us from implementing some of the innovative solutions that come from the community, that come from our regional areas. We had data transparency issues, both from an accountability standpoint, but also from an innovation standpoint. How do we harness data? Things like robotic process automation, things like AI, to do the work of government better. And then most importantly, I saw that we had a moribund, well-intentioned system around people management that was actually at the root of why we were inflexible and couldn't get the right skills lined up with the right missions, and that the need for change around people was perhaps the most urgent of all. And so that focus led us to the priorities in the president's management agenda. And a lot of people have seen the gears. Um, we've sort of overdone, in some ways, the notion of, of the gears of government and the, the fact that they all have to work together. And working together is not just an in-government thing. So we're going to announce later today and, and pass out, this is the one-year anniversary um, commemorative edition of the, of the PMA, uh, one year of progress. So you'll be hearing more about that. But the reason I'm really excited to be here today is as we approach our second year, we're going to celebrate some of the successes that we've had over the last year, um, things like the Technology Modernization Fund, things like our centers of excellence on the IT front, first ever data strategy um, for the federal government that hopefully will provide lots of connections um, to the, the folks in and out of government in terms of how we want to interact. I think a lot of opportunities for uh, the uh, university sector there. A lot of change around people, um, notions around reskilling that we're partnering with universities. But the reason I'm most excited about being here today is where I want to be now is thinking about we've got a lot of the core concepts down. We've got a roadmap of the work that we need to do. The cross-agency priority goals lay out specific milestones, and laps notwithstanding, we're measuring against those milestones. We did have a little delay uh, in terms of updating our quarterly responses because the agencies um, that were in laps had, had a challenge there, but we'll be back on track in June. But connecting to the power of our broad country and our broad resources to have these changes take root in a way they haven't done to, to date is where I think there's the highest intersection between the GDU initiative and what we're trying to do around the president's management agenda. It is not lost on most of us that our system of government is very different than a lot of countries. Although we are a national structure, a federal structure, we are fundamentally decentralized in our operations. States and local communities are responsible for spending a huge amount of our overall taxpayer nationally collected money. 
universities play a critical role, both public sector universities, but also private sector universities, a critical role through grants and other mechanisms of spending taxpayer funded resources to drive change. And so I wanna just talk about a couple of things that are really important that I think we can connect as a community. So um, Tom mentioned the federal executive boards um, they're a, an institution across government of executive leaders in all the regions of our countries. And any, uh, anyone here from FEB? I think there's, well, you're all in Chicago, I guess. Um, so no, nobody's here in the room, but I'll wave to you there. Um, we're already seeing connections between university players and the FEBs to bring together the critical questions. And the reason I think that the GDU initiative is so important is picking a research agenda that is inherently practical is part of how innovation happens in our country. And in the tech world, the pull from the community is the IPO, is the money, is the commercial sway of can I come up with the new algorithm that leads to the creation of a large tech company. In the military space, you know, a major part of the engine of growth in, you know, biotech and in, um, uh, uh, in, in uh, battle technology is coming from the communities that know our war fighters need the best clothing, they need the best medical care, they need the best uh, mission support capabilities. In the management realm, there's billions of dollars of at-risk capital looking at the same things we need, but getting them into government. Data and analytics that work in a sector that is so characterized by law and statute and reg as the federal government that has so many transparency requirements. How do I get the capital into that mission in a way that is inspiring to academics to do the research that breaks things open differently? That is part of how we are thinking in government. We need to bring the power of good government, academia, and the government itself together to solve problems. So I actually have a piece of news that I can't um, miss, and so I've got it on a card here. Um, so we announced um, in the reorg proposal of last uh, summer the uh, Government Effectiveness Applied Research Center, the GEAR Center um, concept, and we've had a lot of conversations about that over the, the course of the summer and the fall. Um, we are shortly going to be announcing the details of a GEAR Center competition with seed funding this spring. And the award will be made by September, and the total seed funding, which could infl include funding for specific initial projects around reskilling and around data, uh, is expected to be under $3 million, but the goal would be to catalyze the kind of thinking that you're gonna hear about today between universities, between the private sector, and with government to drive capital into the research agenda, to drive capital and drive thinking and innovation into the problems that we have in government. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share that with you today. Uh, there'll be a lot more in the coming weeks with more detail on that. But while I've been on the journey of the president's management agenda over the last year, the connection with universities is so critical. You know, Dustin and Mark Busso from my team spent time at the University of Kansas looking at opportunities there. I have traveled to Longmeadow, Massachusetts, where I've met um, with university leaders at Bay Path University who are reskilling women to be on the front lines of our cyber mission. Uh, whether it's in Louisiana or California, leaders from our team in government are looking for ways to tap into the innovation from academia and pair it with the innovation that's coming from the private sector to solve government challenges. So one of the reasons I am confident that we can actually make this change take root 
is because we're not just pushing rocks uphill in government. We've got people on the other side of the go good government hill pulling and helping us. And I think initiatives like the Government to University Initiative are examples of that kind of innovative spirit that partners together to solve these broader problems. So I thank you for the opportunity. I'm sorry to my team if I didn't hit all the points I was supposed to hit. Um, I will figure out how to, how to resolve that. But thank you so very much, and thank you to Tom for uh, the opportunity to be here. And in light of that, I have a limited edition one year anniversary PMA coin from my dear friend from the Volcker Alliance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. everyone. I'm Sarah Mogilescu and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Volcker Alliance. And thank you, Margaret, for coming today. We're just so thrilled to, to hear you and to have you. Um, I'm also excited to be with all the people who are here. Uh, I had the privilege as my in my role as the Executive Vice President to travel around the country um, and conducted and facilitated with Dustin all, all of the roundtables that we did this fall. Um, they were pretty cool. They were pretty cool. Uh, and we were so inspired by our budding partnerships and the incredible potential of what we started to feel in the sites um, that we brought a few of our G2U colleagues here to share um, their stories with you. You'll hear from representatives from three of our sites, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, and Austin. And I just want to give a shout out to the par our partners in North Carolina who are unable to be here today due to um, prior commitments, but who I understand are out there on live stream. So oh, hi, guys. Um, and I'd also like to just quickly mention um, Rosemary O'Leary, who was, is in your program and is the director of the School of Public Affairs and Administration at the University of Kansas. She came down with the flu. So she's not here today. Um, but I hope you're out there feeling better and maybe even watching, because I'm sure that's what you want to <laughs> do when you have the flu. Um, <laughs> The se this segment of this, the agenda is, attended to, is intended to be a sort of fun, dynamic conversation about what we've learned so far and where we're headed. We're going to move through three what we call mini panels, and we're going to leave time after the third one to hear questions and reactions from you. But to make this work on a tight stage, we have some pretty elaborate maneuvering we're going to have to do. So bear with us, but we're not taking breaks between the panels, so please stick with us as we rotate and, and reset. Um, we've included the speaker bios in your program, so I'm not going to spend time telling you all the amazing things that these folks here are doing or have done. Um, so check the program and, and we'll get started from there with mini panel one. Um, one of the biggest insights we took away from the exploratory phase of G2U was that government and university practitioners found it just exceedingly valuable to be together in the same room, period. So in this first mini panel, we're going to explore some of the reasons why. Why was it valuable to be together? Um, to, start, to start us off, we have Dustin Brown. You've heard about him already today from OMB. He's our close partner and a central architect of this effort. We also have Jackie Speedy from Heinz College at Carnegie Mellon. She's, uh, both of these guys will explain the G and the U. Uh, points of view, respectively. We also have Jaime Velasquez from the Government College Relations Council in Chicago, GCRC. Um, GCRC is, is one of the examples that inspired us when we began this journey. It's a sustained government to uni part university partnership that has been working for more than 50 years um, in Chicago and, the, and the, to propel a, a talent pipeline around the uh, region into government. And I'm excited for you to hear from him about GCRC and why it has survived all this time. So Dustin, will you start? I'd like to ask you, why did you decide to explore regional government to university connections during your sabbatical? Well, I think it's uh, pretty serendipitous that we're here a year ago, almost to the hour, that we were announcing the President's Management Agenda in Kansas City. And I think that really was a lot of the seeds for the idea and the inspiration of uh, getting outside Washington, D.C. to launch this administration's management agenda. I 
congratulate Margaret in particular for her leadership of taking us out there and, um, as she said, getting outside you know, Washington. Um, and it wasn't just that we flew in and announced it and left. We really spent two, three days kind of meeting with a wide range of government, business, university um, leaders. And I think it was that kind of experience in that cross-section that really showed the power of this good government message um, across the country and the potential that we could uh, potentially achieve if we more regularly and systematically um, worked with those partners. So that really was, I think, the seed of the idea. Uh, in particular, the ability to have kind of one regional uh, platform that could help us solve multiple problems, whether that's on the recruitment front, where I think many people know the statistic, only 6% of federal employees are under the age of 30. And we're expecting to see kind of increase in retirement eligible federal employees from 15% today to 30% in the next five years. So there's a real need to engage with uh, universities that can help us provide a pipeline of young talent, as well as on the research front, whether that's um, specific expertise that we need or data. Um, it really occurred to me that um, the potential to engage more systematically um, at a regional level, provide an opportunity to solve multiple problems kind of at once through that strategy. So now that you're back at OMB, <coughs> even though it makes me sad to say it because we miss working with you every day, um, what, what do you think were some of the big takeaways from this experience and how are you using them in your role? Yeah, I mean, you know, we kind of had three things we were expecting going into the sessions. Um, one, we thought we'd learn some leading practices that were happening at state and local level uh, in particular. Uh, second, we thought we'd find some gaps, things that people felt really passionate about trying to solve um, that came up through the sessions. And third, we thought we might find a few opportunities to make some connections of people who were in the same city or region but hadn't ever really had a chance to connect before. Um, I think it was that moment where I st started reading the first feedback forms. We collected feedback forms from all 250 or so participants where it really hit me um, that while it felt great in the room, um, the Volcker Alliance provided free coffee. And you know, for federal employees, it doesn't take much more than free <laughs> coffee to get us like engaged and energized about something. I think we um, uh, but the too. feedback forms really showed, I think, the, uh, that we had tapped into something. Um, every single one, it seemed like, mentioned we need more time, we need more systematic ways to engage, please come back was one of my favorite ones. <laughs> and um, it was clear that they really enjoyed hearing from each other in a different perspective um, and wanted to continue that, not just in a one-off meeting, but finding more kind of systematic ways to engage. So I think, you know, seeing that so consistently from one site to the next to the next really showed the value proposition was uh, a pretty strong one. Thanks, and thanks for the G uh, perspective. Um, I'm going to turn to Jackie for the U. Okay. I, I can't get over, I mean, is that old yet? <laughs> the G and the U, because I'll keep doing it. Um, so from the perspective of the university, Jackie, what potential do you see yeah. um, in stronger collaborations between government and university? Sure. Um, it's no secret that technology is rapidly transforming our society. Uh, if you look at the way we interact, the way we're entertained, the way we commute, as evidenced by the scooters uh, abandoned on the sidewalks outside, um, technology has really had an impact at a fast rate. And what's happened is government has done an excellent job governing this technology, keeping us safe, protecting our privacy, but has lagged behind the private sector in terms of utilizing that technology to make our government more efficient and more effective. So I think now is the time, and it's a call to action as Mar Margaret had opened with, that our government move from governing the technology to utilizing the technology for real impact. In order to do that, a partnership with a university that's developing these cutting edge technologies like Carnegie Mellon is critical. Uh, just to give you some examples of how we're doing that locally in Pittsburgh is partnering with uh, Allegheny County Department of Human Services, which you'll hear from later in the panel, um, and, and, and sharing data with them. They're sharing data with us that allows our students and researchers to use predictive analytics to address the opioid crisis. So it's moving from thinking about this crisis reactively. How, what do we do with, with people that are abusing opioids? How do we stop it? To being proactive. How do we use predictive analytics to identify those that are at the highest risk to become addicts? 
uh, within six months of them being prescribed a prescription. So students were able to identify 78% of potentially high-risk uh, uh, opioid abusers um, through this partnership with Allegheny County. And that has, can have significant impacts if taken to scale in government. Um, one other example that I think really highlights this use of predictive analytics to, to create more effective government is a partnership with our Fire Bureau. So they had this enormous task of, of checking 22,000 commercial buildings in the city of Pittsburgh with a very small staff. Sounds like an insurmountable task. Um, they came in to our, to our researchers and students, and our students were able to identify the top 56 buildings that were at highest risk of fire and allowed those, those fire bureau chiefs to focus on those that, that were most in danger um, in our community. So two really great examples of how at Carnegie Mellon we focus on research that centers around people, policy, and technology, but we don't stop there. The main piece is that we deploy that finding into our community so that we can have societal impact. And you mentioned in both of those examples, relying on students. Students to help are a big do some part of the research. Absolutely. Um, not only because they're they're there and they're talented and they're innovative. I don't want to say cheap labor, but um, <laughs> they're brilliant. You know, these, these, this generation approaches problems differently. Um, one thing that's amazing is how interdisciplinary um, their approach is. So they're, they're thinking about things like, who's the human? What's the human-centered impact? Um, they're, they're using creative solutions that, that we may not be thinking of. Um, so when coupled with researchers that are specialists in statistics or economics, it's a pretty powerful partnership. And it's a nice exposure to what government might hold as a career, right? Absolutely. Um, all right, Jaime, you're next to me, so I get to go like this. Um, you've been doing this kind of thing for a long time in Chicago, right? A few years. <laughs> 50. Um, can you briefly describe the GCRC and just quickly sort of the value that you think it adds in your community? Absolutely. Um, I have to say, first of all, hello and good morning to everyone. Also, uh, good morning to all the FEB, our FEB friends in Chicago. Um, the GCRC, Government College Relations Council, has been an organization. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary this past summer. And our main focus, not to give you a whole long history of it, is to promote opportunities and understanding among colleges, college students about all the different things that are available within government, especially as it relates to public service, because the most important thing to our organization is that students who are thinking about public service know about all the potential that's out there. And so we've been fortunate uh, to have a good working relationship with the Chicago FEB office, who's been extremely supportive of what we do. We actually share an intern uh, together. Um, also, representing my university, University of Illinois at Chicago, we've also been fortunate to be a part of the GCRC. As a matter of fact, um, when I was contacted by Dustin in his office related to this uh, initiative, we were excited. We're, I have to be honest with you, uh, we've been in existence for quite a while, and we always assumed there were other organizations like us doing what we do. And so when they told me what they were working on, we were like, oh, okay. And so we're excited about this new uh, partnership and we're certainly looking forward to it. Um, as I said, in Chicago, we've had a longstanding relationship. So we, some Can of the- you say what it is? Like, what is the GCRC? What is it? Yes. First of all, it's an organization made up of primarily Midwest uh, schools. So some of our current members include our school, UIC, DePaul, Loyola, University of Chicago, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and a few other schools. Those are our active members. In terms of government agencies, we work with just about every local, state, and federal agencies with some who are active as part of our steering committee. Some of our active steering committee government agencies include uh, the CIA, the DEA, the State Department, uh, as well as some local agencies. So it's been an incredible thing for us to have uh, that kind of access to them. So one of our signature events that we sponsor every year is a government job fair in Chicago. We average about 40 government agencies. And this fair is open to all the membership schools, but I'll be honest and I'll say it publicly here, we've never turned away any college student from any other school who wants to come to the fair. Obviously, we want to promote as much opportunity as we can to young people. Um, in addition to that, in the spring, we always host informational type of events to promote different topics that people might not be aware of. Um, for example, this spring, uh, come in April, April 12th, and you're all invited, by the way, at UIC, uh, <laughs> we're promoting uh, an event 
where we're going to discuss intelligence type careers versus law enforcement. I think a lot of us know when you think FBI, CIA, you think of agents or spies, right? And the reality is they hire graphic artists, they hire accountants, they hire HR people. There's a whole range of jobs, but young people don't know about it because of what everything they're fed through the media, through the news, to pop culture, they think Jason Bourne and all of that, right? <laughs> And so we find that it's important for us to get that information out there. So we're hosting a panel. Uh, our confirmed uh, panelists right now are CIA and DEA. We're still going to hear from the FBI. And we're also going to get a local government agency to discuss this. And that'll be followed by a speed networking session where they can go around and just ask questions related to career readiness uh, to these representatives, as well as seven other agencies that we're inviting. Um, other initiatives have included, we've done things on cybersecurity. Um, in relations to the type of careers that, that can be pursued and the issues involved in cybersecurity. We've also talked about uh, protective services, and that includes people like the Secret Service, uh, the U.S. Marshals. Are your government partners only federal? No, I, I know I keep talking about the federal, but we work closely with local. We work, uh, for example, with Chicago Police, the city of Chicago. Uh, obviously in Chicago, we have so many suburbs as well, so we work with a lot of local government. Uh, that being said, we hosted a session on careers in public service, careers in public policy, where we invited a lot of local town managers to talk about local career opportunities with local government. Uh, and then of course we work with state. We had a close relationship with the Illinois Department of Human Services, Illinois State Police, to name a few. But we we try and work at all three levels um, to let students know, look, all, this, all, all these opportunities are out there. And again, after 50 years, we've been fortunate to have such a, a pipeline uh, to our students that our events are fairly well attended and we have a pretty good relationship. And again, I do want to acknowledge the FEB in Chicago <laughs> as they've been instrumental in really providing support to us. Uh, and sharing an intern with us. It's interesting because the GCRC, which was one of the, it, there really aren't other GCRCs as far as we've been able to find, um, but it's, its focus is on the talent pipeline and on really making the connections, employment connections between students and government at all levels. I think what GTU, just to kind of close the loops a little bit, is going to do is not only that, but also to try and inspire some of the research connections that um, Jackie was talking about and that um, Margaret was alluding to before. So it's, it's building on this incredible foundation that you guys have built and we wanna learn all that we can about you. Um, one more question, which is how come you've been able to sustain for so long? 50 years is a long time for anything. Well, I do have to, I have to be honest. After 50 years, we've had our ups and downs. We've had uh, times when we've had active membership. For example, our steering committee, our executive committee is made up of our officers, which are five of us. Our steering committee is of about a dozen people, um, and we coordinate all the activities. But our general membership, our paid general membership includes other universities. We're up at about 40, 50 right now. Mm -hmm. There were times when we were like 15, right? Especially when there wasn't a lot of hiring going on. Uh, but as I was telling some people last night, I think one of the most important things is that when you're working with people who share the same values, the same commitment to public service, and the same commitment to working with students, um, it's not that difficult. And I think the nice thing about our committee, and I, I can say this honestly, it's, it's like a family. Right? When we get together, sometimes we have to remind ourselves, oh, we need to open up the meeting formally with Robert's Rules of Orders. Because right? so we just start talking about everything. Oh, so how was your weekend? How was the White Sox game? Eh, whatever. <laughs> White Sox. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Chicago. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're a really close group. And what we've noticed, and even recently, we had a boosted membership. Uh, at our last job, we were at record numbers in terms of attendance at our working session in the morning. And so we had new members. And they immediately blended in. And it was interesting to hear from one of our, the new members who said, you know, this is a great group. Everyone seems to really care about what they're doing, seems to be committed to it. And it's nice because there's a, such a sharing of ideas. Um, and so I'm really excited about this movement and really looking forward to it. It's interesting because that concept, I mean, family, it, it's networks, right? When you get people together and you build connections between people and folks find value in the connections in both directions, you want to come back and meet the people again. Um, and so that's, a, that's, I think, a nice testament to um, the power of working together for a similar aim. Um, so Jackie, you're not off the hook yet. Um, when you are, I mean, you guys at, at Carnegie Mellon are doing just a ton of work with government, and that's one of the reasons why we came to you um, to learn. But can you think about or maybe share some of the ways that you can imagine G2U might help amplify what you're already doing? Sure. 
Uh, so at Carnegie Mellon, uh, a lot of our success with our partnerships with government is built on personal relationships. And these relationships are deep and they're strong, um, and so much so that Peter will explain a, a memorandum of understanding that we have with his agency that helps facilitate this connection. But I think the opportunity with G2U is to bring these relationships to scale, to widen them with other networks, um, bringing in the federal government, not only federal government here in Washington, but federal government that's local in our Pittsburgh region. Um, there's a model that we've housed at Carnegie Mellon since 2015 that was uh, out of the president's uh, White House Smart Cities Initiative. And it's called the Metro Lab Network. And the agenda for that, that network is to um, coordinate relationships between universities and localities, local governments, to help those governments be more effective with the, the wave of new technologies in their cities and regions. So this network has grown. It's now 44, uh, in 44 cities with 60 universities. And to us, that's a model of what G2U can do. It can help facilitate in a structured and facilitated way these connections. Um, as Margaret also mentioned, it, it's brokering a marketplace so that the researchers understand the problems of government and the government understands what new technologies um, and analytics being developed on campuses and how they can affect government um, for good. Thanks. So we have one minute left on mini panel one, and I'm going to give it to you, Dustin. Um, what do you hope that the audience will take away from today? Yeah, coming back to something Tom uh, mentioned in his opening, uh, a lot of this really is about connecting supply and demand, uh, whether that's on the recruitment front or the research front. Uh, I think the ways we've gone about that kind of traditionally, um, I know at the federal level, uh, there's this saying of uh, posting and praying for <laughs> jobs, right? And that came up in a number of sessions and thinking about even the kind of procurement process where we uh, kind of have rather informal uh, relationships with a lot of the partners um, through a kind of competitive selection process. And I think what we heard in the sessions is a lot of the most productive longstanding relationships are ones that have built trust over time. One of my favorite comments actually was from the Kansas City uh, example where we talked about, do you have an MOU that structures you know, how um, University of Kansas works with um, the different uh, state and local governments? That we don't need an MOU because we have a trusted relationship with Alfred Ho, who's a professor at Kansas City, because that's built and up over listening. time. Hi, and Alfred. we know that um, it's, he's somebody that will work with us and deliver, and we've just developed that trust over time. Um, and, and I think that's a lot of what's kind of missing um, because we've kind of gotten so used to the traditional processes that we use to partner with different institutions. Um, and so finding different ways of building that over time so that they can be longstanding um, and uh, deliver value over a period of time, I think is a big piece of what um, we have an opportunity to do. So I'd encourage all of us, whether it's in uh, through the kind of a formal regional council structure or just on our own, to begin to reach out and form some of those relationships with those institutions that really could be delivering value over time. All right, thank you, Mini Panel One. Now, brace yourselves. We're gonna all stand up. Well, not all of us. Some of us are gonna stand up and rotate. I'll get out of the way. Move that chair with you, okay, all right. Okay, no one's falling off the stage. Everyone's moving. Excellent. Hi, Mini Panel 2. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Um, that was very stressful, by the way. That was yeah. stressful. That was like, I, I'm really glad we landed. I almost went over. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we landed. Uh, so when we set out on our exploratory phase, one of the things that we hoped we would do is find promising strategies, examples, approaches, things that people were doing in the field that we didn't know about and that others might be interested in learning about, and, and we did. Um, we learned about a lot of strategies that participants across all of the four sites are driving, and, and many of them have broad applicability across other jurisdictions, which is one of the reasons why we're interested in this work. So our next panel will share some of the efforts that are underway um, in their home states and reflect on how G2U may be able to help augment or strengthen what they're already up to. So again, Please refer to the program for the detailed bios, but I'd like to welcome um, Scott Sellers, who's the city manager of Kyle, Texas, who we met at the Austin session, and Peter John, who's the senior analyst in the Office of Analytics, Technology, and Planning in the Allegheny Pencil County, Pennsylvania <coughs> Department of Human Services. Um, Scott. Yes, ma'am. Let's start with you. 
So when we were in Austin, we learned about a program that you've been driving called the Managers in Residence. Can you tell everyone a little bit about what that is? I can. Uh, first of all, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming here. Thanks to Volcker Alliance. Uh, great initiative. So uh, the Manager in Residence program started about six years ago. Uh, it was an initiative that was brought about by the Texas City Manager Association, TCMA, and I'm going to refer to TCMA a couple times. Uh, TCMA is a subset of ICMA, which is headquartered here in Washington, which is the International City Manager Association. Uh, the initiative was really born because of the pipeline problem that we, we all see. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had better trained, more ethical, more aware uh, local government managers uh, coming out of the, the university presence. Uh, but the problem was the amount of focus at the university level for local government management just was not there. Uh, we found that most people did not even know what a city manager was uh, at the undergraduate level and really wasn't until they got into MPA or MPP programs where they finally realized, hey, there's this whole other sector of local government management that I could be part of. Uh, so part of our initiative was to just bring awareness to the, uh, the college level. Uh, we had a lot of trials and errors over the last six years. Uh, we, we originally started where I think a lot of us think to start, which is, okay, we're, we're reaching out to millennials or you know, Gen Y, so we need to hit them right where they are. We're gonna, we're gonna have better social media. So you know, we've got this great <laughs> Facebook page that no one cared about. Uh, you know, we said, we're gonna, we're gonna refresh our website, lame. Uh, we talked about doing better mentorships and, and internships and really got the, uh, the managers jazzed about it, created this coach's corner on our, our website, uh, focused on it at the uh, conference level, and they were all a bust, honestly. Uh, we found that our, our traditional student membership in the organization was hovering about 20 members statewide uh, per year. And uh, we weren't getting any better. And we finally, we did focus groups, we did surveys amongst uh, not only the managers, but interns that we were fortunate, to, fortunate enough to get to our cities uh, and the university level. And we realized that the missing link, the, the secret sauce, was for us to get into the universities ourselves. Uh, so we created this MIR, the Manager in Residence Program, and we took every university and college in the state of Texas, which there are multiple, uh, <laughs> but we identified the top 14, and uh, we assigned two city managers to every one of those institutions. And we called these managers the, the manager residents. Now, we didn't just volunteer people to, to be MIRs throughout the state. That's a we, helpful strategy. It, it, it is. Yeah. Uh, we, we surveyed and we asked, uh, through every region, which one of you managers has the most interest in the next generation? And we got a very good list, but it was kind of a short list, and we paired those up by region and by alma mater to those universities where they could be most effective, and we put them into the classroom where uh, basically it's pro bono, we're, we're going out there and we are teaching, we are uh, going to career fairs, uh, we're, we're putting together information for professors to utilize in their classroom. And uh, the city they, managers enjoy it? We love it. We love it. It gets us out of the office for one, uh, which is very helpful. Uh, but it's our opportunity to give back to the profession, which is something that's very dear to, to a lot of us, where we're seeing the talent pipeline shrink. So it's our way of, of giving back and, and augmenting that pipeline. So. Um, we were at the Austin G2U session and Scott sort of stood up and said, Did I, let me tell you about a little something something we're doing called the Managers in Residence Program. And, and some of you may know Don Kettle, but he, he, he was really interested. Yeah. Um, so what, what has happened since the meeting? Have you kind of, have you doubled, tripled your efforts? We, we have. Uh, Don <laughs> continued his excitement and enthusiasm. Uh, which is fantastic. The great thing is in that G2U event, there were other university uh, professors or, or practitioners uh, that were hearing this uh, perhaps for the first time and realized, wow, we've got this great initiative. We want managers in our own universities. Uh, Don got much more enthused about uh, the idea and uh, has invited me and, and some of the other university leaders have invited MIRs into their programs. And we are seeing 
a great increase in the interest level in TCMA, Texas City Manager Association, ICMA, and in the local government profession in general. As a matter of fact, uh, we are creating new student chapters that have never existed before uh, with TCMA and the university. And so that's something that's, that's kind of new and building where never a student chapter has existed. Now we have student chapters. And uh, we're also creating, as a manager, as managers, we're creating a, uh, a repository of information that uh, universities can tap into and go back and use as case studies and curricula in, yeah. in the classroom. Do you have more than 20 students involved now? Uh, we are uh, close to 110 right now, and our goal for the year is 200. Awesome. Um, all right, Peter. So we spent some time in Pittsburgh, GTU, thinking about this question of how to connect government research needs with the capacity of proximate universities, sort of a weird Jackie was discussing before. And we loved hearing about what you have cooking in Allegheny County and spent a long time trying to um, understand it. So can you say a little bit about how, are you, how you're coordinating sure. government and university research partnerships? Absolutely, um, and thanks again to the Volcker Alliance and Tom and the rest of his staff. It's really been a tremendous event so far. Um, so I think a history lesson is probably in order. Um, in 1998, the uh, current director of the Allegheny Department of Human Services, a man named Mark Cherna, uh, decided to take a job in Pittsburgh, and he was originally hired to be the director of the Child Welfare Program, which is a job in itself, which is an overwhelming thing. He decided to increase his complexity by many levels and said, um, in addition to that, I would also like to take over the Office of Intellectual Disabilities, aging, and homelessness and housing. Um, and while you're at it, you might as well throw in the entire mental health and substance use treatment system as well. Um, so taking on that task, Mark had a lot of leverage at that point. And so he did two very smart things. One, he went to foundations, local foundations, and got a commitment from them to raise capital to provide more flexible funding to augment and supplement some of the more restrictive federal and local sources that we have. And with that, he built an integrated data system. And this was 21 years ago. Um, and so he would really was a visionary in that work. And then I think when he realized that this data system needed somebody really great to lead it, he hired my boss, Aaron Dalton, who did two things with that data. She increased the technical capabilities of it and um, increased the number of data sources that it hits. So in addition to all the information that we have on our own DHS clients, we also get information from the Department of Education, public benefits from the state, criminal justice, and a variety of other data sources too. And so after that happened, um, Aaron has two very strong feelings. One, that we should collect as much stuff as we possibly can, and then to democratize that data, to give it to as many stakeholders as we possibly can. And um, I think that she is a victim of her own success, and we were inundated by all of these requests from government agencies, not-for-profits, for-profit agencies, to grab our data. And we're good stewards of the data. We, uh, we anonymize and we're, we're following all the, uh, the rules that we need to in order to protect our consumers. But with these collaborations, I think that the complications of these many-to-many -many relationships became overwhelming. And so we released an RFQ uh, in the fall of 2018, which is exactly the same time as yeah. we had that, uh, that summit in Pittsburgh, in which we were trying to gate universities to collaborate with us. And the, uh, the function was really three points. One, we wanted to build long-term relationships with these organizations and not have these one-off individual professors or individual students. Um, we wanted to be able to train them and have long-lasting impact that uh, ex uh, extended the timeline after they left these, uh, these organizations. We wanted to focus the effort from these kind of like pie-in-the-sky national policies, which are great for academics, and force them to have a local impact on the data that we were providing to them. And then the last thing that we really wanted to do was we wanted to create networks where we could force collaborations within universities. I think that it's hard enough to kind of collaborate when you're separated by a hallway, but when you're traveling from one ivory tower to another ivory tower, it gets a little, it gets a little more complex. Um, and so as a result, we've had uh, five universities, everything's bigger. Well, can you stop for what, just so, so when you say gate, <laughs> yes. you put out an RFQ and what was the purpose of it? Sure, so we, to qualify these organizations to have this long sustaining partnership with us. 
So you get them in the door, mm -hmm. not a specific research project per se, but Correct. just sort of on call. That's exactly right. Yeah, okay. so on retainer, exactly. And to, to build these relationships also, because I think part of the issue is, you know, we've had longstanding relationships with, uh, with Jackie and with CMU for many, many, many years, but there are other universities in the area. Um, we have five that are participating right now that we are relatively new with. And so there's a lot of kind of get to know each other. Yeah. They need to learn about our programs and our interests and our, uh, our unique issues, and we need to learn more about their capacity and kind of their technical skills as well. So, so who gets to decide what they're going to research? Yeah, so it's it's collaborative right now. We're calling it collaborative, okay. but we're uh, we're really directing a lot of these projects. So the way that we're organizing this uh, this kind of steering committee is it's going to be like a shark tank take approach, where we're going to have programmatic staff pitch ideas and pitch projects that they feel passionate about and really meet a need that they are seeing in the immediate future. And then we're hopeful that these universities will then kind of commit resources, work on these projects, and then if the project is, uh, the pilot is successful, we're no, we know there's gonna be tons of failures, but the ones that are successful and can either be brought to scale or expand the scope of, we're gonna jointly approach funders. Those funders could be internal through the uh, through other DHS or universities, or they could be private foundations, or they could be you know larger government grants. So Shark Tank, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, big reality show, right, where people come in and pitch their ideas. So you're imagining that the government practitioners mm -hmm. will come to a meeting and say, you know what, I really want to learn about or need to know is mm -hmm. X. That's right. And then what happens? Then what do the universities do? Right. So I think that like in a in a perfect world, I think that you know we it's it's really on us DHS to um, to kind of formulate these ideas. We can't be vague with our project plans. We need to be very specific in the work that we want, and I think pretty specific about the resources that we envision and the deliverable that is uh, that's packaged with that. So after that is uh, presented, hopefully there'll be lots of interest, and maybe two or three of these universities, all with very different skill sets and very different resource would be collaborating on this project okay. with programmatic staff from DHS. So the impediments to quick engagement are sort of removed mm -hmm. through the RFQ. So you don't, you have an MOU standing, you have confidentiality, all, all that's all set up? So we're, we're uh, so uh, we launched our first kickoff meeting in February, so you're catching us at the very nascent stage right now, so we are developing kind of a strategy around that. But the idea is, right, to, to reduce the administrative barrier right. on both our end as well as the universities for collaboration, and that does include data sharing agreements. It's interesting because in every place that we went, folks were kept naming the problems, how hard it is to get the research accomplished, right? How difficult it is to find the right person. And what's nice about this model, and we're interested to see how it goes, is that it alleviates some of those market barriers, and it also allows the government to kind of drive and set priorities. That's right. Um, so when you go into the classroom, yes, ma'am. What do you what do you do? What do you teach? What do you share? Right. So, you know, our whole goal is to bring awareness to the, the profession. So when, when I go in, and, and we've seen this across the state with, with these MIRs that are going into the classroom, we are there to tell them what a city manager is, mm -hmm. uh, what local government profession is. And uh, again, it's, it's eye-opening because most of these, these graduate programs focus on federal, state, nonprofit, uh, and, and very little attention on local government. But I... I see that shifting now just in the level of interest in the students. Uh, if, case in point, I, I have taught three intro to local government uh, uh, day sessions, if you will, recently. And uh, we didn't have any interest yeah. uh, in, in the local government profession. And now we have the first student chapter being formed with, with I think, 10 students that are excited and say, hey, I think I might want to be a city manager. Do you imagine that students will factor in to your research collaborative? Sure. So I think that um, we're, we're hoping that really faculty will drive a lot of these uh, these research projects. But you know, I think that just the the uh, the, the mechanics of this will be a lot of this work will be student led um, at master's levels as well as PhD levels. Yeah. And so yes, absolutely. And we're also hoping this will also be kind of a pipeline for us as well too, in terms of you know getting folks to to learn about our programs at a student level and then potentially transitioning onto full time work at the county. Yeah, cool. All right, we're gonna do another rotate. Brave, get, get ready. Um, although I think I don't have to go anywhere. So you guys just rotate. Thank you, Scott, thank you, Peter. And now we get to mini panel number three. 
And as they say, last but not least, <laughs> Um, so as Tom shared earlier, the Alliance believes so strongly in the potential of these regional collaborations uh, between government and universities that we're investing in two GTU pilot sites. And we have here David Warm, who's the Executive Director of the Mid-America Regional Council in Kansas City, and Angela Evans, who's the Dean of the LBJ School at the University of Texas at Austin. And they have each agreed, thank you, to be the lead partner in their respective cities to help us get a G2U Regional Council off the ground. Um, David, not everyone probably knows what Mark is. Can you start by just saying a little bit about that? Well, Mark is not my first name. It is an, <laughs> it is an acronym for Mid-America Regional Council. We are the association of local governments serving metropolitan Kansas City. Similar organizations exist around the country. In our case, we represent nine counties, 119 cities that span the state line of Kansas and Missouri. We work in lots of policy areas from transportation to early education, public safety, older adult services, and many others. Um, and we have a, a role, most regional councils have a role, of convening a variety of interests around the community. And while we are made up of local governments, we work hand in glove with lots of not-for-profit organizations, business associations, and universities on specific issues. We've interacted historically with universities sort of on a particular research. As, uh, as Dustin right. said, it, a certain professor w will assist with a research project or an evaluation or a training. Uh, and we are excited about the possibility of doing this in a more systematic way okay. and bringing it, uh, bringing it to scale. So yeah, so how does, you are sort of a hub intermediary centerpiece of, of that connects university and government already. What does G2U present? As a, how, does, how does G2U fit into what you already have established? Well, I, I think to step back a little bit, everybody on this panel, Margaret Weikert said it brilliantly this morning, every single government in America at any level is trying to retool its talent, either to bring more people in or to reskill them in particular ways, and to retool its systems to deal with new technologies, new de demographies, new service uh, level demands. And those twin demands uh, can benefit greatly from the resources that come out of universities right. that are the talent pipeline into our city halls, courthouses, and federal office buildings. Uh, they have the ability to bring expertise on all of the issues that I mentioned and many more that is really important to service delivery and policy development. But I think in addition, the universities have a unique asset and that is independent objectivity and bringing that academic independence into a governmental decision-making setting is really important for us evaluating the effectiveness of what we're doing, retooling and rebuilding. Yep. But I'll say one other quick point. We also have an opportunity through the GTU to better align the federal, state, and local partnerships within a metropolitan area. We work well on an operational level across uh, uh, silos of, of government, but we don't on a, on a management level. And I think we have the opportunity to think about these problems of retooling systems, especially in data utilization, and retooling people in a more systematic and, and unified way across levels of government. That was an interesting part of all the travels, but I think it was true in Kansas City too, that some of the government folks had not met their counterparts in exactly. the other level of other levels of government. Right, right. And that's a, a good connection. So Angela, we're coming to you. We're coming to Austin. Yeah, good. Everyone should come to Austin. It's a great town. <laughs> just for just to visit. Um, stop <laughs> taking everyone to, the, to Austin for good. But um, what, what kind of potential do you see in uh, hosting a GTU Regional Council? Okay. So first of all, I really want to thank all of you for coming and listening to all of us. And I want to thank the Volcker Alliance, Tom, and Mr. Volcker, who's been just dedicated to really improving the state of public administration, public leadership. So the potential of this is everyone has said it, I and mean, everyone's, if you picked up the stream, it's like, how do you sustain these types of really good ideas? How do you share these ideas? How do you bring uh, the university and the knowledge and expertise in the university to the public sector? How do you increase the uh, stability of the information? How do you increase the uh, authoritativeness of the information, the relevance and the timeliness? Moving. So this, I've been working on this for a long time and it's very difficult. Uh, and I'm not the only one. Everybody in this room, one of the things that's frustrating uh, about my career is that we keep saying the same things over and over again. I keep seeing the same faces and I keep thinking like, <laughs> when are we just going to do it? And now this is a chance to do it. Uh, this is a chance for us to have a formalized 
systematic, supported way that um, really overcomes individual personalities mm. and really sustains this kind of relationship between the university and government. And both sectors have lots of barriers. At the university, um, I can speak, having been in government and gone to university, totally different world. So when you're looking at the new and energetic uh, professors who understand inter interdisciplinary work and understand practicality, the tenure kind of uh, um, demands that are placed in them don't always align with practical, timely, relevant uh, research. So we have, to, as deans, uh, we really have to work on this. And I'm not the only dean um, that's done this. There's another dean in the room, I don't know if she's still here, Laurel, uh, Lauren Bloomberg from uh, the Humphrey School in Minnesota, several of the deans have been working on this for a very long time, but how we bridge those kinds of relationships. So the Volcker Alliance and these regional uh, um, consortiums are really, for me, a hope to actually institutionalize this kind of work that we've been doing for so long. Yeah, Maybe 50 years from now we'll be asking you why, why how did it last for 50 years? Yeah, well, the LBJ school will be 50 years next year. Uh, and this is what you're thinking about when the school started, uh, when we started these public policy schools building on the public administration schools, the idea was to really grow people who could take information and knowledge and expertise and move it, the yeah. guides and the catalysts out to the policy environment. So we need to pivot now. We need to think about what's the next 50 years and how we do, how we sustain that success. So we've been talking, we've heard about some concrete um, ideas in our last mini panel number two, but I, as we're moving toward launching the, G, the actual GTU Regional Council, are you starting to think about kind of priorities that you might leverage this opportunity to drive? So we don't want it to just be, oh, we're gonna do talent, and oh, we're gonna do research, or you'll wind up in the same room looking at the same people right. and not much will happen. But are you starting to think about the priorities that may um, be well suited for this opportunity? Yeah, actually, we've given a fair amount of thought to that. And part of the uh, agenda that we're shaping out, and it's still coming together, but part of the agenda we're shaping out was uh, uh, instigated at the GTU conference last fall in Kansas City. But a lot of it is assessing our own work as a civic community, where there's momentum, what we're already trying to do. And in our case, and I think this is true across America, a lot of metropolitan areas, cities, state governments, are working on developing new workforce development systems that are aimed at the performance of the general economy economy, and we're really interested in extending what we've learned to do well in the private sector into the public sector specifically. And so we've shaped up an agenda that has to do with developing a more systematic way for experiential learning opportunities for high school students as well as college students to sort of broaden the pipeline. Where We have a particular analytical model we've applied to other industries that do a deep market analysis of what the labor needs are, what the competencies are, what the universities and schools are delivering, and what we need in the future. We want to apply that to the public sector in a systematic to, way. To really understand right. what it, their demands exactly. are. Exactly. We call it a talent to industry exchange. It's a process that in about six to eight months, we bring together the key decision makers in an industry, along with the educators who feed that industry, and we identify much clear sense of what the demands are, what the competencies are, what the degrees are required, what the projections are in our economy, and we then develop an action plan to resolve it. And we want to do that in the public sector. And you have as not well. yet. We have not yet. And so that's something we think we could sort of instigate as a beginning point for broader conversation. We're also very interested in recruitment. We make it really hard for people to find and explore opportunities for open jobs or career possibilities in local government. One of the things that happened in Kansas City was the Office of Personnel Management, lots of FEB folks were there, uh, talked about how there are resources that the federal government has to play through USA Jobs and other associated platforms that can be extended to a broader regional market in partnership with state and local governments. So we're interested in, in building that. And more specifically on that front, there, there is a shell of a platform um, that OPM has been working on, if I'm, if I'm right, or maybe you want to speak to that in a minute, uh, uh, that we hope right. we might be able to kind of pilot in Kansas City by getting all, all the different jobs on the different levels of government centralized and in one place. Right, right. Right. Um, and, it, and just from our perspective, what's exciting about that is if we create it in one place, it's likely that we'd be able to export it to other places. Mm -hmm. 
The, the other idea that we have a keen interest in is developing the capacity for government decision makers to use data, the sophisticated data systems that are being put in place and everything from how we drive our vehicles to how we serve social services yeah. and the amount of data, and I think that Peter did a good job of speaking to a particular process they're, they're using, to use that data in ways that can help drive performance and decision making. And so we're interested in producing a particular academy and looking across the country where there's there's good curriculum being developed that we can then introduce into our local marketplace yeah. for employees and decision makers at federal, state, and local levels. Cool. Um, Angela, do you have ideas too about how you might leverage this? Yes, yeah, so um, we're in Austin, so we're not on the East Coast or the West Coast, so we're smack in the middle of the South. Austin is the capital, so we have a lot of um, our students and a lot of relationships with the state legislative body. Austin um, is an amazing city. There's a lot going on in Austin. We have the Army's Future Command um, that is associated with the university. We're in a tier one public university that opens up lots of different disciplines uh, to us. Uh, we're really good partners with the Bush School, um, and so that's really good. And we have an international border. We can drive to an international border. So when you think of that geographical, um, uh, you know, situation that we're in, it gives us, it really can, we should exploit that. So one of the things we're trying to do now is we have a lot of strength with city managers. We have city managers teaching um, with us. We have, we have an urban lab that will start in another few months. Uh, with the state legislature, we have 46 interns right now in the state legislature because Texas meets only uh, once every two years and 46 of our students are already there. We had a reception at the state legislative body to, you know, to welcome the new uh, Congress there new legislative uh, congress there, and we had, every place you looked, it was like LBJ grads are everywhere, not just as interns. So we have a ready-made audience right there. Uh, we have great relationships with the councils and the councilates. Uh, and we have people at the LBJ school who understand the real value of um, applied research, of how to really do research, and the whole DNA of LBJ is academic and practitioners and blend them. So, wow, you have this incredible, um, resource so how do you bring it together and for me this is an organizing principle you know because it's very hard at least as a dean uh, to start thinking about these things and, and, and actually operationalizing them you think great thoughts and then you go away and there's not there's we don't have the capacity to really move with this this gives us the capacity the Volcker support gives us the capacity to really bring things together so and I'm looking forward to that LBJ do you imagine that the connection with the other universities that will be participating in the council? Yes. Will, what will that do? Well, we have the University of Texas system, which is a large system, and we do a lot of work with the border, you know, university uh, branches in the border. And so if you look at the university in Texas, we have cities that are border cities, financial cities, port cities, capital cities, cities that grew up because of energy. We have examples of all the kinds of cities and the all the kinds of problems cities would have right in Texas. Yeah. So we want to exploit that. Also, I want to do some more work with community colleges because the community college also, um, they're not only feeders into the university, but they really do a lot of work. And that's where you start getting students to think about different careers. Um, because sometimes high school, and even in the first couple years in college, they're not really sure, but there, they're starting to really focus. So I see that as well, as bringing yeah. in some of that. And maybe some even, this is pie in the sky, but we'll see, maybe some international um, How university. Would that? So we would have, maybe what we would do is bring some folks from um, Mexico okay. that we have good relationships with, because I think we should be thinking globally as well as regionally, mm -hmm. so. Do you, when you, th I mean, it's, it's still, we're just starting, so it's hard to know, but I always like to ask, you know, what does it look like when G2U is wildly successful in your site? So if we were to achieve what we're hoping to, or at least some of the things, what, what would you expect to see? David, maybe start, start with you. Well, I, th I think that there is power in the simple idea of bringing together a diverse set of interests on both the G side and the U side in a sustained relationship. And similar to what has been said, once people know each other and begin to develop a track record of delivering something that brings value to the group, they increase their ambition and their commitment. 
And so having that sort of process in place that will allow us to intentionally and systematically think through opportunities, exploit opportunities, I think is an important goal in and of itself. But in addition, we got to do stuff. We got to produce yeah. specific outcomes and products that demonstrate the value to the partnership. And so I think the programmatic impact that whether the, it's the ideas I mentioned or other ideas that we invent, will each need to have their own metrics of what they're trying to move. Are we trying to increase the number of workforce? Are we trying to increase the number of uh, the slow turnout? Or, yeah. or are we trying to create a new skill that isn't being well met in local government? Whatever that metric is, we should be able to count it and measure the success and the value of that given initiative. Yeah. But the real, the real power is in that sustained relationship and commitment uh, to a, a process that will enable us to explore opportunities that none of us can do independently. Yeah. Do you have thoughts? Yeah. I, my vision would be that um, the public sector comes to the university first when they're thinking about their problems, and the university goes to the public sector first when they're thinking about some of the research that they're doing. Yeah. And the way you do that is through this kind of um, consortium, but also you want to build it. You want. Uh, my hope is that people just have this as a second nature rather than an initiative, that the initiative becomes part of our our DNA, our way of working, that would be a great dream so we wouldn't have to be sitting here talking to all of you about it or, you know, doing a sort of pep rally for, for it all. Um, and, you know, when we think about it, and just before I open it up to questions from all of you, you know, we're imagining that there really are some concrete metrics that we hope we can track and see. We want to see an increased uh, placement of graduates into government jobs in a region, right, at yeah. all levels. We want to see an increased interest. You might not be able to measure that, but I think Scott, where Scott um, was talking about just sort of that shift in interest and understanding about what a, a public service career looks like and, and an appreciation for its promise. We want to see more research that does make, that works. Yeah. Uh, the two-way the two street that's helping govern, government pr practitioners do their jobs better and also is, is helping your faculty, your students, create and build. Uh, and, and we're already doing it. I mean, I, right. I don't want to think like we're not right. doing it because everybody's doing some really wonderful applied research and students are involved in it and whatever. Not more. Yes, and we want it to be like second nature. Second right? nature, exactly. Um, and we want to have, you know, it's it's a, it's a in a few of the sites, this an analogy, we've heard of Shark Tank, now I have to do another pop culture, TaskRabbit. Does everyone know TaskRabbit? It's the idea of a marketplace that didn't exist before so that you could find the people that you need who are working on the things that you're working on and have aligned interests, bringing them together. And that's something that we think will, will yield um, much fruit. So we want to open it up to you to ask any question of any person, well, an appro appropriate question, of, of any person on the panel. Yes. Um, good morning. Um, thank you very much. That was a, a marvelous panel and beautifully orchestrated. <laughs> you like the movement. Yes, yeah. very, very nice, very nice. Um, my name is Teresa Pardo. I'm the director of an organization called the Center for Technology and Government at the University at Albany, SUNY. Uh, we just celebrated our 25th anniversary, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm uh, awed uh, at your uh, your successes, Jaime. And uh, uh, while I won't be there in 25 years, I'm, I'm sure CTG <laughs> will be. Um, I'm excited to be part of this uh, meeting and to hear about the work that you've been doing, um, because at CTG we've been, uh, like many of you in the room, doing this kind of work for that 25 years. So I'm really excited. Um, I think um, uh, Jackie very. Uh, much uh, identified with your comments about creating a more systematic framework within which we can all do this kind of work. But ultimately, now my question. Um, so one of the things that we do at, at our organization, at CTG, um, is very much what you're talking about. We've been doing public-private partnerships um, for the 25 years, focused on these uh, complex public problems. And often, at our organization, we need to reach out uh, to other academic departments, whether at our campus or at other campuses. And so what I'm hoping is that this kind of a framework might help us, um, if you will, orient some of our colleagues who aren't necessarily um, prepared to do engaged scholarship in the way that we might want or need them to. 
And so we've talked about workforce in terms of uh, government officials. We've talked about uh, other kinds of workforce development. But I think there's also a need to do kind of workforce development in the academic community. How do we prepare our young scholars to think about doing their research in this engaged and action-oriented way? Um, sometimes I need a computer scientist as part of a collaboration for a year, sometimes just for a week. Right? So as we have loosely coupled or tightly coupled collaborations, I wonder if you all have thoughts about how can we do a better job uh, preparing the academic side to be good partners in these kind of GDU collaborations. If you want to well, I, I can take it from it, being in both the public sector and then in the academic sector. I think it really has to do with the leadership of the school and the university. Um, because I think if the leadership in the school really tries to support this type of engagement and highlights the engagement and gives that faculty member some leeway to do that, um, I think it's helpful. Um, and we have a group of deans that have been working for uh, about three years now. We call ourselves the Dean Summit, it's just a name. Um, but we've stayed together to try to figure this all out. Um, so people are working on it. I don't think there's one clear way to do it, and it's certainly not easy. And it's my trouble is that if you do this and then the deanship changes, mm. you'll get another dean that may not so you've got to trigger, figure out how to sustain it within the folks. You have to help them figure out how they manage their time and their career so they can be successful in academia. The second thing is, I think it's really important to get other deans from around the university in an informal way, get them together, talk, talk to them about it, yeah, um, and get they have a relationship with you. Jackie? So I'll just add one quick thing. Um, CMU is a little bit unique in the fact that when Andrew Carnegie created it in 1900, this is going somewhere, don't worry. In 1938, <laughs> shortly thereafter, he had a mandate that um, science and engineers took classes in humanities and social sciences so that they could understand the impact their work had on society. So that's, as Angela said, it's based into the leadership of the university. One thing that has tactically worked well, I, I believe, at Carnegie Mellon is we do have low barriers between um, our, our colleges and departments that really fosters the interdisciplinary, but it's joint appointments of faculty. So we often hire faculty that have some responsibility in the College of Engineering, some in the Heinz College, or some at, in the um, Computer Science Department. But that, that structure, that formal structure that aligns with their incentives for tenure um, helps facilitate that type of interdisciplinary work. One more comment just, on this? Just uh, real quickly from my uh, perspective, one of the things that we say on our team is we have horizontal problems and we have vertical mm -hmm. organizations. And I think one of the things I've picked up uh, through the last six months is that's not just true in government, that's also true in the university side. And one of the things we've been trying to do is just systematically find people whose full-time job it is to be conveners and to really see themselves as people who can search across kind of the different disciplines or different organizations and find all the right people that need to be on the bus, you know, to take it in the right direction. So I do think carving out people's jobs who are primarily responsible for that convening and collaborating, not just kind of responsible for a specific uh, project or program or discipline, uh, can go a long way. Other, other questions? Oh, yes. I'm John Turcott, I'm director of the Program Evaluation Division staff uh, for the North Carolina Legislature. I'd, l I'd like to ask the two deans uh, uh, this question. I'm, I subscribe to a lot of listservs, and occasionally I get a uh, job announcement for a practitioner in residence at a university, and the very first qualification is must have a PhD in public administration or political science. <laughs> Now, and I know that there are practitioners in residence that are in many universities. I'd like to ask the deans just exactly what they do. And as a practice, do all the deans require practitioners to have, in residence, to have PhDs before they apply? Well, well, just I'll speak to that. That's not true at LBJ School. You do not have to have a PhD. Uh, as a matter of fact, what we try to get is people who have spent their careers in public service. So, um, for example, now we have, uh, we just last year had uh, Julian Castro. Uh, he taught a class on housing. Um, 
So he was an actual professor and he taught. He co-taught in other classes. He held seminars about how policies made. He was just open for people to come in and out. Uh, we have another person there uh, from the Congressional Research Service. She does have a PhD, but she didn't have to have one. But she is the national leader, uh, thought leader in immigration. So when we bring them in, we bring them in on a contract, uh, like a three-year contract. It could be a three-year only. It could be a three-year rolling. They have responsibilities for teaching. Absolutely, that's one of their primary um, responsibilities to teach. And the second one is to have kind of some kind of service role. So if you're in my school, what I use a lot of them for is innovative thinking. And they're on teams, and they actually can help alleviate some of the uh, committee assignments we give to uh, tenure, tenure track faculty when we're trying to do innovative uh, um, you know, pre-work uh, for um, some things. So we don't, we don't require a PhD. Um, neither, neither do we. Um, so we, we often use practitioners, um, as Angela said, to teach. Uh, but a newer model we've been doing for the last three years is bringing in, I would say, younger practitioners that have done really innovative things um, in the private public sector. Um, for example, we had somebody that started a science and technology school in Pittsburgh, and so we brought him in to infuse that innovation to our students, and we had him create a course that our other faculty didn't have bandwidth to do that looked at um, the future of education and how is technology going to impact tech education in the future. Um, so it allows us to explore some new and innovative and kind of more future-leaning topics um, from people that have experience in the field. And you, you're a manager in residence. So there's a, that's not necessarily permanent, right? And, that's, and I do not have a PhD, <laughs> so that's nor a will I. That's a part-time job. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Back there, yeah. Hello, good morning. My name is Beth Schill, and I work at Georgetown University's Career Education Center, and I serve undergraduates interested in public service. So. That's a lot. Um, my question is, um, I also work with employers, and I notice a large disconnect between government agencies that I'll say are less well known, and both at the federal and the local and state levels, and students in terms of where they see themselves. And I'm curious, with all these fantastic partnerships and stories and real impact that you all are having and hope to have, how do you propose to get the word out to students so that they can start to envision themselves in say some of these agencies, Dustin, I'll pick on you at OMB, where they may not know what does management budget mean for them as say a history student or a math student or statistics or some other liberal arts uh, degree. So how do you propose to get those stories out? Do you want to talk about that? Uh, well, if I can start, uh, some of the work that we've done uh, with the GCRC, and especially at our university, I, first of all, we're fortunate at UIC to be 30,000 students strong and have 100,000 alums within the city of Chicago uh, and surrounding area. So we try and focus on alums who are out there working locally and bring them in. I think when our students see, oh, there's an alum coming to talk about their job, they get exposed to positions they never even thought about. Uh, so that's one way that we try and focus it out there. In, in addition, through the GCRC, because it is open to member schools, it's a collaborative effort with DePaul Loyola University of Chicago, and so we can reach out to their students as well. Because you're absolutely right, when students are thinking, and if they think government at all, they think federal agencies. But there's certainly a lot at the local um, and at the state level as well. We're also fortunate in Chicago, too, with our recent election. <laughs> that we had a number of local people running for office who were from the University of Illinois Chicago. And they, they've also been very active on campus coming back and speaking to our students. Let me give you one example with respect to GCRC. In our um, session on public policy careers, we brought in uh, Jesus Chuy Garcia. Some of you may know that he ran for mayor in the city of Chicago, lost to Rahm Emanuel, but that's okay because then he ran for Congress and he won, so he's here now. I don't know if he's here right now, but. Uh, and he's one that's been very active in coming back to campus and speaking about public careers. But when he speaks about public service careers, he also talks at the local level because he started off as a committeeman. He started off doing ward level work. So we try and bring in speakers that students can relate to and hopefully he gets them to start thinking, look, yeah, there's these great positions out there, but there's some really good stuff you could do at the local level, which may have more impact immediately on your community. Scott, did you have a... Yeah, my answer may, may also answer another question that was asked earlier. 
you know, a lot of times we try to solve problems for the, the younger generation and we bring together our team of older generation or experienced practitioners, experienced academicians, and we don't put ourselves where the students are, where the next generation is. And that's one thing that we had to realize is, you know, here we are a bunch of, uh, you know, tenured city managers, if you will, trying to make decisions for the next gen that may not even know who we are. So we brought them in and asked them, where are you getting information about local government? Uh, and it was all over the place, but we found a great organization that we partnered with called uh, Emerging Local Government Leaders, ELGL.org, and we found that they were doing a very good grassroots effort to get the word out to, to these uh, younger students. And so we said, instead of us recreating the wheel, let's just partner with them and see what they can bring to the table. And they, uh, with us, we, we created this, uh, what's called the ELGL Inspire event. And that is a two hour long event where it will uh, focus on the undergraduate students. And uh, we, we go across disciplines. So it's not just the policy discipline or, or government administration, but we'll go to the arts or the history uh, and we'll invite them all to just a quick, uh, you know, what is local government type of, of focus group. Uh, we, it's a very cost effective event. And at the end of it, it's just about being exposed. Uh, the students don't need to know anything about or have any desire to be, become a city manager, but we want them to be exposed so that uh, we can augment the pipeline into the graduate programs and of course then into the profession. I think we have time for one or two more. Maggie. Yeah. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Benya Kraus, and I'm one of the co-founders of Lead for America, uh, a new national nonprofit that is addressing um, part of that pipeline question into, into local government specifically. Um, as a recent undergraduate graduate myself, um, I just first want to say thank you for this panel. I feel just so inspired that all of this exists um, and, and all the great work that you are doing. Um, my, my question is for um, Scott and Dustin, but would happy to hear some feedback as well uh, from, from other folks. Um, just by quick way of background introduction, Lead for America, we uh, recruit, train, and place recent undergraduates into local governments in their own home communities, so sending them back to especially rural and tribal and economically distressed urban communities. Um, and just within first two months of our recruitment um, on a pretty tight budget and um, you know, a, a team that just for two months was dedicated to formal recruitment, we received 683 applications wow. um, for what were essentially 20 national hometown fellow spots and then 20 uh, uh, fellowship positions in local governments across North Carolina. Um, we are housed within the UNC, UNC School of Government, so it's a, they're a great partner in, as the, the U in the G2U here. Um, but, uh, you know, in that process, we just introduce people in mass uh, to their local government, uh, host, potential host supervisors. Um, and, and there was a lot of, we actually saw that a lot of young people actually do understand the importance of local government and want to be involved. Um, and so my question would just be, how could we position ourselves both as an organization, but also um, as young people to first, you know, make um, these applicants attractive to local government um, and, and I think also federal government too, but also how can we be thinking about the procurement and recruitment process so that, um, I, I love the question about, you know, if you're not a PhD and also at the undergrad level, you know, Google is hiring out of undergraduate, um, but how can we be thinking about the procurement process on both the student end as well as on the local government and, and about how to um, bridge that gap together? Thanks. You wanna start, Scott? Uh, sure, I'll try to be quick. So we, we uh, didn't know about Lead for America, but actually during this process, because we created the framework, uh, we did find out about Lead for America. And we are actually partnering with Lead for America now to bring some of these students into Texas, which is great. Uh, to really answer your question, uh, I tell all of the students, uh, experience, there's nothing greater than experience. And you know, then the next question is, well, what does that look like? Uh, internships, there's only a finite number of internships. Uh, we are talking to Lead for America about uh, not only uh, creating better internships, but by creating longer internships, uh, you know, or even a two-year type of, of a program management program. And uh, you know, 
the, the more these students can, can get practical experience, the, the better they're going to fit into the industry uh, and more exposed they're going to become. So again, we're, we're, we're very excited to work with you on that program. And I think this next uh, fall, we're actually going to start implementing those, those Leaf for America students. Yeah, I mean, just real quickly, I think it is about um, kind of year-round continual engagement, whether that's guest lecturing, whether that's the practicums, whether that's when it comes time to recruit, um, uh, finding those kind of partnerships throughout the year and in different ways, I think really can ensure that um, there's an ongoing kind of relationship that gets formed between um, the appropriate kind of government agencies and then the university. I think that is a real powerful way of making sure it's not just seen as recruitment or not just seen as research, but we really have an ongoing um, kind of set of relationships across the, uh, that throughout a student's kind of life cycle. I think we have time for one more question. Right in the front. Um, hi, my name's Nora Dempsey, and I'm here with my colleague, Bridget Roddy. And together we run the Virtual Student Federal Service Program, so VSFS. And Bridget started it 10 years ago this month, or no, this year. Yes, so we thought it would be very relevant to mention that U.S. college students, whether they're undergrad, graduate, or PhD candidates, can intern virtually with the federal government. So you can work with NASA, <coughs> excuse me, Smithsonian, the State Department, so each year we have thousands of students apply and it's a great way for students to gain work experience and for the federal government to bring in new fresh ideas and energy. Mm -hmm. And so we just wanted to make sure that everyone here is aware of the Virtual <laughs> Student Federal Service Program. Um, and one last thing is that um, we've, we're exploring now the idea of how we can um, make sure to connect with local governments. So last year the, under the Department of Justice, the National Institute of Corrections joined up and began working from their federal agent, see, right through to the states who are running prisons, and, and it was very interesting for students. So we'd like to explore that. So really our question is, how can we make sure to get the emails for all of these great panelists so we can follow up? <laughs> we will do that. That we will do. We have time for one more right here. Hello, uh, my name is Paul Schlotman. I'm with the University of Dayton School of Law. And I just wanted to make an observation and also, uh, I guess, a, a charge or an ask. Um, I uh, believe that what we're hearing a lot of is that um, as government agencies and universities, we're pretty good about collecting data and figuring out our needs. However, we probably aren't so good about taking initiative. And so what are ways in which the Volcker Alliance or those of us that are uh, here can agilely take initiative like business does in order to uh, get our needs met? Well, I, I would only say, I mean, I think that's the whole purpose is to create a, a door right. th and, and an impetus and an opportunity that will enable initiative and that will allow us to unlock the resources in the universities uh, to better engage with the governments that they're supplying labor to and supplying information to. This was said in a couple of other places. Being on the G side of this equation, it's really easy to find an academic. It's really hard to find a university that will really engage as an institution. Or it's really, and oftentimes academics bring their own research agenda mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily match with the research needs needs of the government that's trying to solve a particular problem. And I think what we're creating is a platform to break down some of those institutional behaviors that will allow us to interact in more sophisticated, intentional, purposeful ways. I mean, I think that that's what we are here to do is exactly what you said, is to unlock some of the institutional inertia, both on the U side and on the G side, uh, that, that uh, doesn't allow us to interact with each other with, with intentionality and purpose. Because we were so efficient with our choreography, we can actually have one more question. You have someone? Hi, thank you. So um, my name is Trevor Kaladne, and I am a, a presidential management fellow in the Treasury yeah. Department at the um, Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau. And um, I was just wondering, you know, when I, when you think of how potential employers position themselves on campus right now, and you think of the ways that they reach out to students, you know, I think social media was mentioned, and, you know, the value of meeting someone face to face and having someone that you can talk to um, through these processes. 
You know, one thing that I find working for government is that you know bureaucrats um, and bureaucracies tend to be very um, risk averse and very cautious, especially with regard to external actors. Yeah which I think is part of why, I mean, sometimes you see how boring some of these websites are, but sometimes maybe that's part of the point. <laughs> I don't think so. so. <laughs> uh, I guess, like, my question is, you know, when you're looking at how you try and position, you know, government as a potential, you know, opportunity in this landscape, how do you take into account that fundamental you know, cautiousness and risk aversion that I think is common in many places, if not throughout uh, the government. Thank you. You know, this is a, this is a really timely question because last week, uh, ASPA, the American Society for Public Administration, I was on a panel with Angie Bailey, who's here, and Dustin and others, and one of the things we talked about is we are growing all of this talent and we're getting them to be very innovative and very quick, and then we're putting them in settings, and some of the settings, people don't know how to manage them. They don't know how to manage to those talents, to those, those kinds of expertise. So one of the things we're thinking about doing, uh, at least at the LBJ School, is working with um, the people who are in those mid management levels and actually having seminars and talking to them and having them meet the students and they have to get used to the fact that when they ask a student to do something the student will actually get it done get it done quickly and timely and that people go like oh you got it done so quickly because I've had students they actually call me about it and they're very I'm concerned about it because we're putting them into environments that don't necessarily meet and match with the kinds of expertise they have it's absolutely a great question I, I also think that these uh, GTU forums can create a platform that will allow a cautious bureaucracy to yeah. throw a problem into the middle of a table to be advanced and they don't have to own it. And, and so I, I, feel, I feel like that's a large part of what convening intermediary agencies can do or intermediary processes that are bringing together universities and others is they, take, they can advance an idea, advance a system, work it over, pilot it, and the government who's interested in the outcome can let it be test driven and, and, and proven before they have to adopt it and take political ownership for it. And so I think that there's some value in just the partnership in advancing that dynamic you discussed. You have to go right, to it, yeah. right. Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to mention one of the more unique programs that we've had, we recently were fortunate enough because of our partnership with the CIA was we were able to bring in seven students in November to CIA headquarters. And what we did is we chose students based on their level. So we had a freshman, we had a senior, we had liberal arts, we had a computer engineer and in between there. And when we met with the CIA, they paired them up with different parts of the agency to learn about those different types of careers. So we're you know, looking at the whole spectrum of it and then matching them up. In addition to that, to that trip too, we were also fortunate enough to bring him to meet Dustin over at OMB who shared just a wealth of information uh, in terms of what's available at the OM, uh, OMB. And initially it was the CIA, but when students were there and they met and they heard what you had to say, they were like, wow, we didn't know that this was here, that these types of opportunities existed there. And we said, look, and this is just a few agencies here in Washington. There's just a whole range here. Of course, we have them locally too, but there's just so much out there. So trying to get them exposed as early as possible and to expose them to a whole range of different types of positions really helps. Yeah, and I just kind of uh, add on to that. I think we really need to change the culture in government where the expectation is you have some of your best people yeah. be responsible for going out and recruiting. Uh, I wouldn't be in this position today if OMB didn't make one of its senior kind of SES available to go recruit on the Maxwell School campus, wh who inspired me to want to come to OMB um, 17 years ago now. Um, and I think we need to change that dynamic and really make it the expectation, really the culture uh, within uh, government that we are expecting our top talent to be part of the recruitment and hiring process to bring in that next generation. All right, last word to Scott. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't want the last word. Well, uh, almost. I, I think the armed forces do a great job with this. They get out and they get to where the the youth are. And so we, we have kind of taken that same approach. This first year of, of this MIR program, we are inviting all of the students throughout Texas to our, our annual conference, no cost to them. And we are putting on an intercollegiate bowl where the students uh, representing their each individual university will be uh, engaging in six events against each other and that will culminate in a one large session where we're going to bring all the managers in and uh, the students will come and show university 
pride, team spirit, and the managers are going to wear their colors. And it's just to show that we're human. <laughs> you know, it knocks down that we're the bureaucrats in, in suits all the time. But we can get down to your level. We can have fun, and, and we can uh, show you that that you know, you're going to want to be part of us because because we can let our hair down at some point. Too. All right. Well, I wanted to thank you all um, for being with us today and for your um, continuing partnership as we go into the next phase of this initiative. We're going to exit, and Tom's going to come back on. OK. Again, let's thank the panelists, all of them, for what is a remarkable job this morning. <clears throat> They're all incredible partners to the Volcker Alliance, and I really appreciate their insights and ideas, and particularly their enthusiasm for uh, our Government to University initiative. And we really appreciate your coming to Washington and be a part of today's event. You know, as the Volcker Alliance and our partners around the country set out to build uh, G2U, regional networks, um, we know we still have a lot to learn. And so we began looking around for some real experts. And today we are excited uh, to receive some words of wisdom and advice uh, from a woman who has literally written the book on networks. Um, Anne-Marie Slaughter is the CEO of New America, a think and action tank dedicated to renewing America in the digital age. She is also the Bert uh, Kerstetter University Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. From 2009 until 2011, she served as the Director of Policy Planning for the United States Department of State, and before that served with distinction uh, as the Dean of Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Amidst all of that, she found time to write the Chessboard and the Web, Strategies of Connection in a Networked World. Please join me in welcoming Anne-Marie Slaughter. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to actually just begin uh, where Angela uh, also started, which is to say how honored I am to be here, particularly for Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker is a Princeton alum. I had the very good fortune when I was dean of the Woodrow Wilson School to engage with him quite a bit. He is not shy about expressing his opinions, uh, and they are strong opinions. Uh, but he is really a role model uh, for so many of us. He is a man he's at 90 who has dedicated his entire life uh, to what we at Princeton call Princeton in the nation's service and in the service of humanity. So I'm just particularly pleased to be here uh, for an alliance that bears his name. So as Tom said, uh, I've been studying networks since I was 19, uh, since 1994 as a legal scholar and as a policy uh, scholar. And indeed, I, I think probably my best title is network evangelist. And I'll explain why I got started in networks even back in law school in 1982. I read a book by Carol Gilligan called In a Different Voice, where she talks about two basic structures of organization and of power. So one, of course, is a hierarchy, as she called it, the ladder. If you're in an organization that is a hierarchy that's a ladder, you want to be at the top. That's where the power flows from, top down. The other structure, and this is 1982, is a web. It's a horizontal structure. It is a set of relationships. And in the web world, power flows from the center. And I was very struck by that, even then as a law student, thinking I'm more interested in being at the center, in being at a world in which we mobilize horizontal power rather than command top-down power. Well, the world has definitely played along. That was 1982. Now, in 2019, the fact that we are in a horizontal networked world is, is a cliche. It's where we all start. There has been writing since the late 1980s about how corporations have moved from hierarchies to networks, uh, about how we are in a world in which we need to interact much more uh, with our peers. And of course, the internet has both enabled that, 
but is also the classic example. So you just think of a map of the internet. There's no hierarchy. The biggest sources of power are the people who are the most connected. So as I said, I've been studying networks. I started studying networks of government officials and wrote about uh, government networks, central bankers, judges, legislators, uh, environmental regulators, all these different uh, members of government who networked with one another. Then I became a dean and discovered a whole nother reason to care about networks because, as we've heard, deans have no power, or at least no vertical power. Right? You are titularly at the head or the top of an organization of tenured faculty members who you cannot fire and you cannot really give them much of an incentive. In other words, salary, that kind of thing. You could give them a parking spot. Uh, when Danny Kahneman won the Nobel Prize at the Woodrow Wilson School, I kid you not, the one thing he asked for was a parking spot in front of the Woodrow Wilson School. But you know, you only got a few of those. So you do not have the normal ability to exercise command and control. Your only way of making things happen is to essentially operate in a networked way, to bring people together, to mobilize them, to connect them uh, in valuable ways. Then I moved to government, which is a hierarchy, <laughs> uh, and very definitely does have structures of command and control. Whether they always work or not, that's what the bureaucracy has learned how to do, which is to thwart them uh, in various ways, but also to get things done, I, I, you know, both ways. But it was very clear in the State Department, and Secretary Clinton believed this passionately, that to really solve our problems, we had to go way beyond government. That's exactly what GTU is talking about. We needed to be mobilizing civic actors, corporate actors, and by civic, I include the entire nonprofit world. And that we could not possibly do what we needed to do, whether it was countering violent extremism or mobilizing people around uh, environmental issues or health issues or even you know, building public uh, networks of public diplomacy between countries. We had to work horizontally. Very difficult to do. I spent, I think, 18 months just on a memo that would allow the State Department to work with the Aspen Institute and 16 CEOs, but still more fodder for the need for, for networks. And finally, at New America, we're actually trying to transform a traditional think tank, which is also not hierarchical in the sense that I preside over many very independent, strong people. But a think tank, the idea of it is sort of a, a closed place, think of a tank, sitting in Washington, coming up with solutions for people across, that we then hand off to government, and government implements them, lots of ifs and, and contingencies there, and then they're somehow implemented across the country. That is not the way we are solving public problems in this century. It is impossible uh, to think that we're actually gonna come up with the answers. What New America is trying to do is to implement what we call the new practice of public problem solving, which means human-centered design, finding solutions rather than inventing them, experimenting continually through the use of data, and then designing for scale. And we're trying to put that into practice and to be a networked organization ourselves. So I start with all of that just to say why, when Tom said, would you come and talk about GTU, I said, this is absolutely a piece of what we need to do to advance what all of us are about. We're all here because we're committed to solving public problems. And we do that from the university, public policy school, and many other centers, whether they bear that name or not. And we clearly do that in government, and we do that at every level. Uh, so let's then think about uh, when we most uh, when we get the most value out of a network. And here, I've done a lot of, of academic research on networks. Uh, Tara uh, McGinnis and Denise Ross from New America interviewed 20, the heads of 25 civic networks across the country. And you, many of you know a lot of these networks. What works cities, right, from Bloomberg or the uh, Rockefeller uh, 100 Cities, the Resilience Network, or something like Built for Zero that tackles homelessness. And what we came up with was the, where you most need a network is where the problem is bigger than any one entity can solve, which describes almost all of our, our problems, uh, where 
You've identified lots of innovations that are already happening, and you need to link them. And this is very important. And I, as I was listening to this panel, I thought, this is exactly where we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We, we just heard Jaime Velasquez say, we've got this center. We've been doing this. That's where you go out and find what's already out there, and you connect it, rather than deciding you need something new uh, and inventing it. Uh, and then finally, a network is particularly valuable when you want to reduce the risk uh, of innovation and embolden local innovators. And actually, that last answer, there was an answer that said, you know, um, you can make it easier for government officials to innovate if you provide support that other people are doing this and you create ways so that no one innovator has to own the whole thing. So these are ways... Uh, uh, the circumstances under uh, which you will have a network be most effective. GTU meets all those requirements, right? We've got lots of great things going on. We've got lots of great things going on at the local and the state level. I'd say there's more exciting stuff going on at the local and state level by a lot uh, than going on at the federal level. You have universities that are pro uh, proliferating public problem solving programs and centers in lots of ways, uh, and they themselves need to be more networked. And what GTU effectively is, is a network of networks. So let me just unpack that a little bit. First place, federal, state, and local government. That's actually a vertical network, right? There is no direct command and control. Yes, in some areas, I'm a lawyer originally, but in general, you've got different power centers doing different things. So just connecting them vertically, you'd think, well, of course they're connected. They're all part of the government. No. They're not, uh, and they're certainly not in ways that where we're thinking here, how do we both create demand and supply uh, for a new generation of public talent, but also how do we share innovations? So you have that vertical network, but then you have the efforts to, co to connect each of those across, right? The local governments across, the state governments across, even the federal government, but well, that's a whole nother, nother uh, uh, topic. And then you need to connect the universities. So what you're, and the universities themselves need to be more networked. It, we all have silos, right? So the bureaucracy has silos, but so too, as we were just hearing, you know, when I, when I taught at Harvard Law School, a diverse dinner party was where you had law professors and maybe a historian or a political scientist, right? I mean, the idea that you would know the engineers or the humanities folks, of, we're all, we all do what we need to do and we're all deeply siloed, so we need networks within universities too. So the challenge for GTU is how you bring together vertical networks, horizontal networks into one network that can really advance uh, the goals. And that's a question of network design. So the, the most important thing to understand about networks, a network is a bunch of nodes connected by links. Right? So, and right now, if we could map uh, this relationship, this would be what we call a star network. My talking to all of you, I'm in the center, and I am connected to each of you. And that's a, that we, it, it is a temporary network, but if we then created a listserv uh, between me and all of you, uh, it would be a, a more, more uh, established network, and relationships would make it a network. That's one way to, to uh, structure a network. Far better, and those of you who are teachers in the audience will know this, would be actually ways to connect you, right? So that you're not just learning from me, you're learning from each other. And better yet would be then to be able to select out those of you who really are like and can learn the most from each other, then you get to what's called a pod network, where there is a center, but there are pods of, or, or subhubs of people who are working on specific things. Uh, and then you connect all of those. There are different structures of networks, and different structures are better for different functions. And I'll give you one example there. Uh, so let's imagine what we wanted was a resilience network. We want something that will withstand attack. I mean, looking at the Midwest floods right this minute, right? If you were thinking about how are you going to build a network that will withstand disaster, you want neither a star network 
or a pod network, you want a mesh network. You want something that's as distributed as possible, as many different nodes in as many different places as possible so that they'll have a better chance of surviving. So different structures, different functions. I'm not gonna go through all each one, but what I wanna want you to come away with is it's not as simple as just connecting everybody. And it's not, and, and actually, more connections can be bad. So again, if you think of networks that you are in, if you simply connect everyone, you often quickly get overwhelmed. If you think about, all right, here are the different pods, and which a few connections can actually connect pretty much everyone. That's called the small, a, a small world ne network. And you wanna think about how you do that so people in the network get enough information and enough connection to help them, but not so much that you lose structure or frankly, as we think of with our listservs, we simply tune out. So there's a, there's a, a way of thinking about uh, how to design this network uh, that really goes to whom do you connect and how, and how do you then uh, manage and lead that network. The other thing that networks need are capacity, uh, paid capacity. And this is, uh, if any funders are in the audience and listening or on uh, the webcast, uh, some of you have probably heard me say this before, but the actual work of connecting and keeping those connections and deconflicting, you know, you see tensions coming and mobilizing and re-energizing and saying, yes, you know, we connected this university and this local government and you committed to doing this, have you done it? This is network by nagging uh, and the parents will recognize what I'm talking about. Most networks that work have that capacity in them, it is often unpaid. And think about your social networks. There's always somebody who is the one who says, hey, let's get together and let's actually go do something and then follows up and then make sure people know where you're meeting and then pings the people that didn't respond. That is work. It is the work, it's horizontal, right? There's no command. There's, it is all about mobilization and energizing and activating. And to really make a network work, you have to see where it is and pay for it. Uh, and this is something I'm, I'm very excited about the way G2U is evolving. I think the way starting with two hubs and seeing how those go uh, in Kansas City and Austin makes a lot of sense and then spreading that. Uh, but as you do that, uh, you will need actual support for people who can make that network work. And that will be true of the sub-networks as well. Uh, there are m different titles for this job, network activator, network manager, uh, network operator. What's important, just as we now pay curators, and curators used to be people only in art galleries, but now that we find them all over the place, with that we create these titles, we recognize the work, uh, and we actually uh, support it. So in my few remaining uh, moments, uh, I, I wanna give you one example just to, uh, or two examples of how we're trying to do this at New America and then put this in larger context. Um, so New America has just launched a university network for public interest technology. So public interest technology is technology in the public interest. We are analogizing from public interest law. It used to be you were a lawyer, you could do legal aid, but there was no such thing as a public interest law career. Uh, and that has been created since the 1980s. So now if you want to be a lawyer, you can go to a law firm and make a living. Uh, and But you can also uh, go from that law firm to the government, to a nonprofit, and then when you need to pay your mortgage, back to the law firm. Uh, and, but we need similar kinds of careers for technologists, because all of us in this world need technologists at the table. So we have mobilized, we have brought together 21 universities, getting 21 presidents and provosts to do anything is quite a feat. Uh, they have come together and agreed to be part of a network to, to build the pipeline for public interest technologists very much as you, as GTU is trying to build the pipeline for a new generation of public servants. 
Each of those universities immediately is going to have to figure out how to network within. So we have a faculty liaison who is the person who then is responsible for coordinating things on their campus. Harvard has two faculty liaisons because there are so many silos. Uh, but ASU at the uh, Arizona State University has the same. So occasionally you, you actually really need, you need a lot of capacity at the university level. Then figuring out how do we bring these uh, universities together in ways that are real, that are not just that website, right? Not just that database, but is, is active collaboration in ways that allow people to apply for funding together, to deliver results that are much bigger than they can deliver on their own, to partner with people they might not otherwise know. So we've got a basic structure. We're experimenting. It's very similar uh, to the way GTU is thinking about uh, proceeding in terms of stimulating both the demand and supply side. Uh, and I frankly hope we can partner uh, in various ways. The last thing to say is when networks are not useful because they're not always a solution. Indeed, one of my colleagues at Princeton did a paper on Al Qaeda that basically said, Everybody talks about Al-Qaeda or any, uh, any of these terrorist networks as this is the, the new form that makes them adaptable and, and they can escape destruction. He said they'd rather be a network. I mean, they'd rather be a hierarchy. Hierarchies are much more efficient. Right? They're much more centralized and they're a lot quicker. You can order people to do things and they will do them. So it, the flip side of that is if you're going to have a network, it's not going to be that efficient. It's going to be messy in lots of different ways. You're going to have to take in as much as you send out. You're going to have to listen and get innovation in and change what you think you're doing as much as you send out, uh, which is worth thinking about uh, as, as we go forward uh, with GTU. But this network couldn't happen at a better time. Universities are reinventing themselves. They have to reinvent themselves. And the ones that haven't figured that out will be figuring that out through economic pressures uh, in the next five to 10 years. But they're also reinventing themselves, moving away from being the ivory tower to being the community hub. And the far-sighted universities that are getting that are finding ways to partner with that, those local governments that are also reinventing what they do and reinventing their relationships with business and with the civic sector on the ground. That process, and Jim and Deb Fallows in their book, Our Towns, say that the towns that re are reinventing themselves across the country are the ones that are pr close to a major research university, public or private, big or small, or sometimes a great community college. That process of reinvention and innovation is a part of what I see as a larger wave of American renewal. And in the news at the moment, we don't see a lot about renewal, but it's happening. In fact, I would say it is happening on the scale that the Great Awakening happened in 1930, or the progressive movement, which again, 1898 looked bleak, 1900 to 1920, we remade our political system, we remade our economic system, and we laid the social foundations for what became the New Deal. That wave is actually out there. We've got to be out there to be making those connections and harnessing those innovations and energizing that new generation that wants to get things done, doesn't just want to go to Washington for a title, wants to actually make things happen. It's out there, and GTU is exactly the kind of organization we need to, con to reach out to local, state, federal, and universities across the country in something that is really a part of a major wave of American change. So thank you very much. So you know, Anne Marie's a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. Listening to her makes me really proud to be a lawyer, I'll tell you. She's amazing, thank you so much. You're thoughtful insights on how we can be sure this initi initiative reaches its full potential were amazing. Um, we knew we would learn a lot from you. We have already, uh, but we're going to have to gain more uh, from your experiences and your amazing mind, so we will partner together. 
Um, we're excited about being a network activator um, and trying to stimulate uh, the networks that were so beautifully described by Anne Marie. I want to close by reiterating what I said at the start, and that is that we are really excited about the G2U initiative and believe unequivocally in the potential of regional action to drive national impact. When we are fully up and running, uh, we hope to engage a range of national partners to fortify our efforts in the reasons in which we are working as well as nationwide. Uh, there's so many groups out there trying to rebuild and renew uh, American government uh, from the bottom up. Um, we heard from Lead from America. There's Govern for America. There are all sorts of innovations that are happening among young people that are exciting, and we need to bring all this together in a powerful way. Uh, I want to again thank Margaret Weikert and Anne Marie Slaughter and all of our other panelists for making this a memorable, interesting, and exciting event. Uh, I especially want to thank our G2U partners around the country uh, who are following on live stream for their patience uh, as we pressure tested these ideas last fall. Uh, I want to express my gratitude uh, for the vote of confidence and continuing support uh, that we've received from the Robertson Foundation for, for Government. And I wish to publicly thank the staff of the Volcker Alliance, Anelia Stevens, Peter Marcy, Maggie Mello, Sarah Magulescu, Melissa Austin, Yesenia Martez, Martinez, and Sarah Morningred, all of whom are here with us today, along with uh, Emily Bolton, um, Maureen McCarthy, Naomi Major, and Noah uh, Wynn Ritzenberg, who are, are back at the home base or elsewhere working on behalf of the Alliance. I appreciate all they did uh, to make this event possible, but also uh, to execute on the vision uh, that Dustin brought to us uh, for a G2U. Uh, Congressman Tom Davis uh, may still be here. He was here earlier. He's a member of our board, and our board has been incredibly supportive of this endeavor as well, so we thank them. Uh, and last and certainly not least, I'm extremely grateful uh, again to Dustin Brown uh, for choosing uh, the Volcker Alliance as the place to spend his sabbatical, uh, but also uh, the incredible assistance he's been to us in driving this initiative uh, from vision to reality. The work of strengthening and renewing our government institutions is a task that will in fact demand commitment from every corner of our society. We at the Volcker Alliance stand ready to do our part, and we are excited to partner with you uh, on this journey in the months and years ahead. Um, so we are appreciative of your time this morning. Uh, this will conclude our program. As you're leaving, I think there may be just a few copies left of Mr. Volcker's uh, autobiography, uh, which I watched him write uh, on a yellow legal pad uh, by himself. Uh, he had a great editor, too, but he, he did it himself. And I uh, talked to him Monday. on his face when he learned about um, this kickoff of what something he's dreamed about for years was really inspiring to see. So uh, if you haven't got one of his books, if there are any left, pick one up. We also have a book by Paul Light uh, that we help uh, support. Uh, it, it looks at government and the size of government and uh, outsourcing and contracting and, and uh, all sorts of really interesting issues. Uh, and finally, we have copies of our Preparing Tomorrow's Public Service um, report uh, that really sort of helps stimulate our thinking about what we need to do to focus on uh, the pipeline and also focus on people that are in government and how can we help them uh, do an even better job. So again, thank you. Uh, we appreciate your being here. We look forward to working with you in the future.